everybody. Welcome. Come on, what a room. Uh, so, man, uh, so on behalf of the, the C4 Board of Directors, we just want to welcome you to the event. A few months ago, a couple thousand miles away, I sat in front of some young, terrified, anxious, and excited young counselors in Istanbul, Turkey because there's an incredible heroin epidemic over there and there are zero resources. If you think we're struggling to fight it here, you should go over there. Because, what is that? In Turkey. Because you all came here today, we are providing treatment to young men and women in Istanbul, Turkey, all the way across the world. So give, your, give yourself a hand. It was absolutely incredible. And that's the one thing that a lot of people don't know about C4 is we're, we're a nonprofit. And I, I think which is incredible because we get to do, we get to commune and we get to convene and we get to connect people with no agenda other than giving you education. And we take whatever proceeds we get from something like this and do, go do good across our country and in other countries. For a long time, we did that in, in, in really quiet ways. And we decided the last couple years, it needs to be known and it needs to be celebrated. And I think you all know it because you feel the energy around these conferences, this one in the Cape and some of the other ones. It just feels different. It feels connected. And so here's what I would invite you to do. And it actually goes with the, you're going to hear more from me later, but it's going to go with the theme of tonight's talk. I think a lot of times we go to these gatherings, and my good friend David said this to me today, it's like a, a car show. It's like we clean our car up really nice and we pop the hood and we, let, we tell you everything about our programs, or our private practices that are awesome. And then all of us know that's not the way it goes. <laughs> what if we could be, what if we had permission to be as human as the people we treat when we were together? What if we could show up this week and walk away being filled up, not being exhausted because we didn't get invited to the right demo or we didn't know who to network with? What if we could take our hats off and be human beings together? Because let me tell you, this is a room full of heroes. Look what we get to do. I mean, just take a look around and look what all of us get to do. That's what C4 is about. That's who we want to get behind. We want to be a leader for you guys. We want to hear where we get it wrong, and we want to hear where we get it right. But we're going to shoulder up, and we're going to try to make addiction and mental health treatment services across our country, and for that matter, across the world, more attainable and more reliable and more successful. And you all are foot soldiers to help us get there. So you didn't know you were behind an organization with a big reach, but you are just by attending this. Obviously, it's not why you came. We hope you get your education needs met and all your networking needs. We will be here to do that. But I just wanted you to know that there's a heartbeat behind this organization. You all are a part of it. So welcome. Thank you so much. We didn't plan this transition, so I'm just going to roll with it. Uh, let me introduce you to tonight's speakers. Um, it's kind of weird because I'm one of them, but uh, <laughs> these are uh, incredibly important people to me, and I don't think I'm honored and humbled to get to stand beside some folks that are talking about authenticity when it comes to what we do. And so we're here to take you on a journey. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit. We're going to move around a little bit and have some fun. Uh, but I just love that I get to work with these great folks who are doing great things in the field. And we're going to start off by introducing you to my colleague and dear friend, Lizzie McLaughlin. I want to tell you guys a story about a seven-year-old little girl. Mother was an alcoholic. Father was extremely codependent, enabling. And she had two older sisters. And because of the dynamic between the parents, she relied heavily on her sisters to get some of her needs met. A lot of those needs, attention, validation, security. I mean, she slept with one of her sisters every night. And she had her own room. Mom gets into recovery. And a year later, remarries. And with this new marriage comes a new little girl. 
And although she was really excited to have this little sister in her life, it meant she had to share the attention of her two older sisters. And she really struggled with that because that's where her needs were getting met. And so at that time, she started getting involved in sports um, at a really young age. And she noticed that, or she started seeing how talented she was in, in this particular sport. And so immediately it shifted to that was giving her the validation, the attention, the security that she needed to continue. She continued that through through high school. There was some substance abuse, but it was pretty minimal. I mean, just a typical high school student, I mean, maybe not so typical, but some, some substance abuse. And um, when she graduated, she got the opportunity to go to a Division I university for this sport, which was a really big deal. She was gonna finally get to continue the work that she had been working so hard for her whole life. She got to college and quickly realized she is no longer the big woman on campus. Everybody is as good, if not better. And so what she was, that validation that she was feeling at that time, and those, getting those needs met weren't working anymore. And as that happened, substance abuse, relationship addiction, male dependency, some sexually acting out, eating disorder, all of that started filling in to try to help get those needs met. By the end of the first semester, they had asked her not to compete in the final competition. And she dropped out of college. I guess if you can't tell, I'm talking about myself. <laughs> Probably picked up on that. Um, it was a quick downward spiral past that point. I got to um, probably about six months after that point, maybe a year, I had an intervention done on me, which was amazing, and I got to start a recovery journey. I got to know um, how to live life without using substances, how to manage my eating disorder, and found a little bit of hope. So that was the start. <laughs> um, about, after about a year of or being in treatment and then halfway house and all of that, I was ready to join the workforce. I had a little bit of recovery, and over the years, I, one thing that I learned to do really well was people skills, because in order to feel validated, I got people to like me. Um, and so I was able to use that, and I got into sales. And I did really well. I was employee of the month a lot. All I had to do was make people like me. I mean, it was a pretty, pretty easy gig. About two years after that, I got the coolest opportunity to become the executive assistant at the treatment center I attended. If anybody knows anything about an executive assistant, it is very much a leadership position. It is not an assistant at all. You're jumping into leadership. And again, up until that point, I hadn't had much experience with leadership, so it was a little, a little scary. Um, my boss was, in my opinion, the epitome of transformation, a transformational leader. And immediately, he started soliciting, soliciting my advice. He was like, what do you think about this? And up until that point, I had never been asked that question. Nobody had asked my opinion about something, and I hadn't developed that part of me that really knew my opinion about things. I knew my opinion based on what everybody else thought. So like, someone else liked hiking, I liked hiking. If so, you know, but I had never really developed my own opinion, so it really got me to start, start thinking about things. I had dealt with a lot of stuff in my recovery, but relationship addiction and that just dire need for attention and validation was still very much there. Um, about six months into the job, uh, relationship ended and I fell apart. I mean, I was just, it was like another bottom. It was another downward spiral. And um, my boss at the time, he could have just, I was doing a really bad job, and he could have just said, it's time for you to go. You can't handle this job. Or he could have said, you know, let's just fix it. Let's just band-aid it and just, you know, get over it. Let's just go. Instead, he looked at me, and he said, I've got a tool for you to do. I know how I can, I know how, where you can get some support and help. I'm talking about Miles. <laughs> and so he sent me to my first Living Centered program. And it changed my life, as most people are aware that have done that program. And I was able to um, 
really address the neglect that I got from my mom, the emotional absence that I got from my dad, the relationship piece that I still hung on to, and just a number of other things. I was able to kind of address that stuff. And from that point, I did that, and I started to really dive into doing my work. I really started diving into good, oh, another th huge thing I got was, of course, I started to get to know me. I don't like hiking. It's not my thing, you know? And it's like, up until that point, I really thought I did because my boyfriend did, you know? And, um, and so I got to know those answers, which sounds crazy, but it's so, like, it's just such an, <laughs> an awakening. So I, yeah, so I got to know myself and continued to do the work got involved in a leadership retreat, um, therapy, did 20 other programs. And as I, the more I did my work, the more I noticed my leadership was growing. So I went from executive assistant, which again is very much a leadership. I moved into admissions, sorry, I'm snotting. Um, program <laughs> coordinator, program director, to now I'm the vice president of a world-renowned treatment program. Yeah. <laughs> And I can honestly stand up here and say it's because of the work I did. It's because I stopped looking this way. I stopped trying to external, thank you, my codependent friend, BJ. <laughs> I stopped, <laughs> I stopped the external validation. I stopped trying to seek outside of myself. I turned the focus inward and I just grew. And another huge piece is I had a leader that believed in me and that supported me and that held me up and Ask me the questions and saw it in me. So, <laughs> sorry. I'm such a crier, but this is like a lot. Um, one of the coolest things that I, of course, have gotten over the years is like, I, was, I had no self worth, no confidence. And of course, I, through this, I've gotten a lot of self-worth and a lot of confidence to where I know who I am. And as a leader now, I get to do that with my employees. I get to lift them up when they're struggling, inspire them, and give them self-confidence and self-worth. And it is the coolest thing ever to have that come full circle. So, yeah. This is a hula hoop. <laughs> I brought this in because this is representing my visible self, or ego self. I want to call it ego self, but I know that can have a negative connotation, so I'm going with visible self. So this is the part of you and us that interacts in the world. It's the part that has, fulfills the roles that we have. So mother, father, coworker, churchgoer, whatever the roles we are, that's this part. This part also develops strateg strategies to protect your wounded self. So it's a very, it's a very important part of us. It, yeah. yeah, so I think that's good about the visible self. Does everybody understand that visible self? Okay, so we got another part. You have to bear with me. I wasn't prepared to have a held, handheld mic. Yeah. Okay. All right, we got it. We got it. All right. So there's another part of ourselves, and this is the authentic part of ourselves. So this part is our meaning and our purpose. This part is our passion, our calling. It's um, if you have a higher self or a spirituality, it's your higher self. It's your core values and your core feelings. So this part is very the core, the most inner core part of us. I chose this ball to represent this part of me because up until about eight or nine years ago, it, I didn't have much recognition of it. It was there, but I did, had, hadn't been developed. And so this is kind of about the size it was. And I'm gonna just show you. <laughs> so that whole piece is one person. And again, a lot of times we get hung up and working in the visible part of ourselves. And part of the work I had to do was develop this authentic self. So it grew. Oh, yes. And it sparkles. 
So, and it's pretty appropriate because this is your visible self. This is what you're going to show people. So I kind of want to show you a little sample of how I did that and how I, how I work on that. So, so they're very much connected, but I'm going to have them separate just for this exercise. Is, any, is everybody familiar with empty chair work? Okay, so it's going to be a little bit like that. So once again, on this side is my visible self. This is how I interact in the world. This is how I show up. And this is my authentic self. This is what's really going on. This is my core feelings. So at the beginning of the year, I was vice president of operations at OnSite. And I really was overwhelmed. I was managing four different departments. And it was just, I was a new mother. It was just a lot, lots to take on. And so my boss, Miles at the time, I called him in and I was like, I am overwhelmed. I don't know that I can do this. I don't know what to do. And he was like, are you happy? And I was like, I'm really not right now. I'm not happy. Um, part of, some of the departments I was managing, I, I didn't know much about. So it was a huge learning curve. And I'm trying to do that plus this plus, and it just got overwhelming. And so I, after much dialogue, we decided it would be good to kind of step back, change my title, drop some of the departments, and be vice president of programming. I wanted to kind of show you the dialogue that came up for me because if, I mean, can anybody relate to that feeling of failure? <laughs> yeah. So that's very much what came up for me in that moment was a huge feeling of failure. What the hell? Do you even know what I've done and how much I've done in this role? Miles, you're here. Would you mind coming up and sitting in for this? <laughs> I mean, might as well do it in real time, right? Um, I'll just sit you there. Because these are me. You're sparkly. What the hell? You put me in this position. I, I mean, do you even know what I've done, how hard I've worked to try to make this work, and you're just going to change it and just say to me, like, I don't know that you can do this either. I, I've worked my butt off, and I'm going to feel like a failure. So what's really going on is... I agree. <laughs> I can't do it. I'm exhausted. I'm not efficient in my role. I'm not doing the company any good. And I wish you would have just said it instead of asking the question, do you think you can do it? I wish you would have just said, hey, I don't know that this is the right role for you. So, I'm going to stay in my authentic self because I feel like this is where I want to be. It's hard to live in here at all times, but it's a really important part of us. And I just want to say. I, I wanted to say something and I didn't because I wanted to say the right thing instead of what I probably said, which was um, I would have liked to have shot you straight, but I, my experience is you don't have the ego strength to handle it. I disagree. <laughs> I, I agree that what you have seen from me is pretty reactive, a lot in this. So, very reactive and defensive to the feelings that are coming up because ultimately, <laughs> I feel like a failure. And but that doesn't mean I can't handle the information and that I don't know how to go elsewhere to process it. I will cry, it's kind of my MO, but it doesn't mean that I, I'm not strong. <laughs> so, 
I feel like I need to stand with this. So, it's been hard. It's been a hard year and a half. I'm a new mom. I'm growing as a leader. And I just want to give a shout out to all of the mothers out there. We can do both. We can. We can be strong leaders. There's been so many times in meetings where, especially po like right after giving birth, I was so hormonal and I would just break down in a cry in a meeting. And that, but it's okay. Like, that's okay to do. It doesn't mean we're not strong enough, you know? It just means that we got to have that process. And so just shout outs to moms out there doing both because we can be leaders. I know we can. Or we are. We are leaders. Are you kidding me? Have you ever met a mother? So <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Paul Alexander, and um, this is really cool. There's so many people in this room. Um, I, uh, I'm honored to speak at West Coast Symposium, and I'm especially honored to speak with Miles and Lizzie and my partner, Mike. Um, I'm not a professional speaker. I don't do this that often. Um, that's my disclaimer. Just did a little uh, talk at NATAP with our chief clinical officer, and that was fun. Um, so a little bit, and I got like a lot of technology going on. That you know, I'm not going to be doing any chair work or anything <laughs> like that. It's part of my story, but you know. Um, and I think we're supposed to do this right for the some organization. <laughs> so these are our disclosures. Um, that's on site, at least I thought. It kind of looked like the woods back there. So about me, right? This is me. This is my son, Noah. Okay? I live in San Clemente. Um, my family is the center of my universe. And... Um, I have a son who's six weeks old now, too. Um, his, name, his name's Dean. So, and that was Noah's nickname. That's how we came up with the name. So, baby Dean. And my wife is Silvana, and she's not in recovery. She's a good Catholic woman, and she keeps me in line. She's Italian and Mexican. So... I'm kind of figuring out this iPad thing, so I'm in recovery, my family, I love to surf, golf, and hunt. Yes, I live in California, and I love to hunt. Birds. I shot a deer this past year. It wasn't a lot of fun. Mike and I did that together. Um, and yeah, I work at Northbound, so my priorities kind of go in that order, right? God, my recovery, my health, my family, and then work. And I think a lot of us in the field have that upside down. And I remember when I first got into the field, uh, I had a sponsor. The only thing we had in common was addiction. And he uh, was a, a guy in his he was late 40s, Mexican guy, grew up in Santa Ana. And he said, you know what? You can go work over there at that treatment center, but don't make it your program. Because that's that's, that has nothing to do with recovery. And Mike likes to say, we work in the depths of the disease. And I believe that's absolutely true. So this topic about leadership is really about taking care of yourself. That's a big component of leadership. So we want to, we want to teach you a little bit about leadership. Why do we want to talk about leadership? You know, why is it important? Um, what does healthy leadership look like, you know? Um, some of us have preconceived notions about when, we, when you say the word leader, at least from where I came from, it doesn't necessarily look like what Lizzie just demonstrated. But what I've come to learn is that, that is true leadership. That is real leadership. So we, you know, our hope is today you'll get a little taste of that, and it'll get your wheels turning about what healthy leadership looks like. And we also want to talk a little bit about how to develop as a leader, 
and in turn how to develop culture. Okay? So I'm going to be do, doing some flipping back and forth. I apologize. Um, so the way, the way my brain works is I want to go out and get a book or take a class. You know, I'm, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my family, but I'm a perfectionist, you know, straight A student, had to do everything to the extreme, love black tar heroin with cocaine in a syringe, went to law school, like, I always, like, have to, you know, adrenaline sports, love that, you know, always living on the edge, um, and I always was taught, like, if you want to do something, go read a book and implement it. But leadership doesn't work that way. And, you know, as I begun to study leadership, what I learned is that it's kind of like an action. You kind of have to live leadership, and you have to do your own work. That is a foundational piece so it's kind of like working your program, you know. You can't, you can't, you know, read a book. You don't just read the big book and then, you know, go, oh, okay, now I know how to stay sober. It's all up here. It doesn't work that way. You have to practice. You have to fail. You have to get up, pick yourself up, and, and try over and over again. Um, so these are some of the reasons we want to talk about leadership I believe one of the biggest threats, and there's a lot out there right now, our industry's really weird right now. I've been in the industry for 18 years, and it's getting weird. <laughs> um, but I believe firmly that one of the biggest threats is we're tearing ourselves apart from the inside out. And when I first heard that, I was like, what are you talking about? I mean, it's a simple concept, you know? A lot of us get into this field, and we have a lot of baggage, right? We got sober, and, you know, we just took away the drink or the drug, and we still got, you know, all the stuff we bring to the table, you know? And that, that was my story, and guess what? When I, when I got sober, I, I really thought, you know, I just like the way drugs and alcohol feel. My family was fine. My family was perfect. Well, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Client outcomes. I, our clients know when we're not healthy. I was a counselor for years. When I was sideways, the guys on my caseload would look at me and go, what's wrong with you, man? Like, why are you talking to me like that? Why are you showing up like that? Our clients are intuitive. They know. And, and if you're healthy, they're going to pick up on that. And if you're not, th you know, they're going to they're gonna know. And it's going to affect their outcome and their engagement. It also is going to shape behavior. Leadership and good culture shapes behavior. It affects retention, and it also helps with recruiting. Out of the top 100 places in the U.S. that are considered great places to work, they have a 65% lower turnover. They retain people. Okay, so if, you, you know, if you're interested in retaining your, your people, culture is important, leadership is important, happier people are more productive people, your reputation is everything, and, and in today's world, our reputation is public, and people are vocal about it, and there's online channels, et cetera. And I believe you'll make more money. When Mike and I first started talking about uh, leadership and culture, I kind of looked at him and said, well, are we going to make more money? Like, what are you talking about? And, and at that point in time, I didn't know what leadership was. I didn't know what a healthy culture looked like. I had worked at two organizations for long periods of time, but they were extremely dysfunctional. Extremely dysfunctional. So I love this quote. It's uh, Peter Drucker. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, operational excellence for lunch, and everything else for dinner. Okay? That's a great quote. And like I said, you know, it's like, okay, well, how do we get there? What, what are we going to do to develop a culture? Well, when I started studying leadership, um, this concept of emotional intelligence came up. Are any of you familiar with that? Okay. 
So I want to, this was interesting. I dug this up. This is the quote from the, the psychologist that's, that actually coined the term. Emotional intelligence is the ability to perceive emotions, to access and generate emotions so as to assist thought, to understand emotions and emotional knowledge, to reflectively regulate emotions so as to promote emotional and intellectual growth. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so here's the issue. This is kind of the, the crux for me. So as I learn these concepts, um, so I, I grew up in West Virginia and moved to California when I was 10 years old. And when I was, as I was growing up, um, my father was a perfectionist and he moved our family. He started with nothing. He moved our family out of West Virginia and he worked in the eye care industry and he, he, he's been very successful you know, helped with surgically implantable contact lenses, LASIK, all that stuff. But he was an absolute perfectionist. And when that garage door went up and his car pulled in, me and my two brothers, I'm the middle child, we were like, oh, crap, here comes dad, you know. I hope mom doesn't tell him what happened today, you know. Scared, scared to death of our father because he was he raged he didn't drink or drug but he raged and that was the household we grew up with I, I, I remember stories where you know he would come in and and beat the crap out of us for no reason right no reason and we're just little kids you know scared to death and then my mom was emotionally unavailable she still is to this day. I love her. I see her all the time. But she, she comes over to my house, and we don't talk about anything. She plays with my kids, and, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this. I'm like, I hope nobody tells my mom or dad these stories, but <laughs> it's the truth. Like, and I have, a, I have a hard time talking to her about this, let alone a room of 200 people. But so what, what that did to me is I was emotionally shut down. So fast forward. Um, I get clean and sober, and tw at 24, clean up off of heroin, and work the 12 steps. It changed my life, spiritual awakening. You know, started working in the treatments. I grew up in the in the treatment industry. That's all I've done: driver, counselor, this, that, and the other thing. And you know, by the time I was 34, I'd started northbound. So here I am at 34, and I'm spiritually bankrupt. I'm emotionally shut down. And the people that worked with me were not very happy. I mean, you know, I'm looking at some people in this audience that were even part of my journey at that point in time. And I was like my father. I was explosive, reactive. Um, not a pleasure to be around, right? So how am I going to become an effective leader, right? If I come from a, a family that I can't express my emotions and drugs and alcohol fixed, fixed everything, now I'm clean and sober and I'm having these issues at work um, and, and Mike comes to work with me and I remember when I'd see him, when I'd walk into work in the morning, I would just give him a head nod. What's up, Mike? And go about my day. Because when you come to work, you work. It wasn't, I don't, it's not making friends. It's not connecting with people. Okay, so, so, what, so Mike says, look, look, Paul, <laughs> we need to do some work. And I said, okay, what are you talking about? And we bought, brought in a guy that actually was a facilitator at Onsite. And we go over to Mike's house. And we're in this room, and there's wood floors, and, and they, they start doing, like, this psychodrama. And they, and they grab, grab, uh, grab one of them, and they put, put this dog blanket over his head. And they start having me talk to him like he's my father. And I'm thinking to myself, 
these guys have lost their frickin' mind. What are we doing? And then my, my former partner who was there too, he tears the blanket off his head and goes, this thing smells like pee. And Mike goes, that's the dog blanket. That's where Tank lays every night. So that's, that's kind of how my journey began. Is, um, and then somebody said, you know what, Paul, we're going to do, we're gonna do a, a 360 assessment. Have any of you done a 360 assessment? That's where people from, uh, that are above you, beside you, and below you really give you honest feedback about how you're showing up in the workplace. That was an eye-opener. I thought I was really good at my job. Not the case. My average score was like 5 out of 10 on most of the measures. I'm like, wow, this is bad. So, so all this stuff I'm telling you about my father and my mother and my family of origin... I didn't, I didn't have that, I didn't have the ability to even be aware of that, let alone talk about those things in a room like this. And I went, I did a family sculpt, and my dad was off in the corner, not facing me, you know, facing away from me. My mom was right here, but facing away from me, and my two brothers were alongside of me. And that's when it clicked for me that, you know, I had to take care of all my own needs. And really, if I'm going to lead people and I'm going to be a part of an organization, I have to learn how to connect with myself so that I can connect with all of you. And so, you know, I've, you know, I've done... LCP1, LCP2, went for, with a therapist and diagrammed my whole life and started connecting the dots. And I think Mike's going to talk about that. And it's through looking back at our lives where we can begin to connect the dots. And we can begin to be real and get vulnerable. Um, this was me at work before. <laughs> Vulnerability is weakness. I, I didn't have a dress and her heels on, though. Um, you come to work and you do your work, don't let them see you sweat and emotionally shut down. What I've learned is that, that I can jump over a cliff like this guy right here. Sorry guys, it's giving me problems. That vulnerability is actually risk and emotional uncertainty, okay? And, and I love this quote by Patrick Linsoni. He's a, he's a big fan of ours. We read his book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team. He's got great information about organizational health. At the heart of vulnerability lies the willingness of people to abandon their pride and their fear, to sacrifice their egos for the collective good of the team. I began to see that this being vulnerable and telling people the truth and sharing my authentic self it wasn't about me anymore. It was about the team and about the clients. And that's why I'm here. I don't know why you're in the field, but I'm in the field because treatment saved my life and introduced me to recovery, right? And so this isn't about me. If I, and, and another thing that we like to talk about at Northbound is everyone's on a, everyone is a leader on a team defining the culture, and the experience of our clients. Everyone, regardless of what department you're in. And here's another quote I'll kind of uh, end on. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. And, and I really believe that... Uh, I really believe that vulnerability is the birthplace of leadership. That's where it begins, and that's where organizational health and developing a great culture begins, is through your ability to show up and be real. And that's a relief. You know, it's a relief when you can let go of your perfectionism and you can just show up and be you and not really care what people think about you and just be real. 
And, and it's been powerful to have people that I work with that have the ability to do that, you know, that have the ability. We, you know, I have a, a female colleague who I won't name her name, but she showed up to a meeting and she said, I'm, I'm over it. I just had another child and I can't do it. And, you know, I'm not sure how this is all going to work out. And for her to be able to show up and say her truth like that, you know what it allowed? It allowed that weight to be lifted off of her, and it allowed our team to move into solution about how to rectify the situation. Left unsaid, or in a workplace where that type of behavior is frowned upon, that, that person probably would have left the organization. I'm convinced. So... It's an honor to talk to all of you, and, and this is the craziest presentation. I love you guys, but like, <laughs> we, had, we had no idea what we're, each other is talking about. <laughs> I said, Lizzie, what are you going to talk about? Well, I'm just going to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I have no idea what Miles is going to say, or Mike, or anyone, so I hope that it's educational. I hope it's informative, and I hope you enjoy it. So thanks for listening.